If everything is relative, what can be more relative than relations between the sexes? Every week, your host Jack Kammer talks with a man or woman on the podcasts Men Are Talking or Goodwill Toward Men and aims to deliver at least one idea that will make you say, wow, I never thought of it like that. Today, Jack talks with a woman on Goodwill Toward Men. Today on Goodwill Toward Men, we talk with Jennifer Harmon, professor of social psychology at Colorado State University. Dr. Harmon specializes in research on intimate relationships, power, family violence, and application of social psychology to underrepresented populations. She considers parental alienation to be a form of family violence and child abuse. In this interview, she addresses the ideological science deniers who deny not only that parental alienation is a form of family violence and child abuse, but who deny that parental alienation even exists. Hello, Jennifer Harmon. Hello, Jack. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for your time. I, I really appreciate it very much. So, Professor Harmon, you are a social psychologist at Cal, uh, Colorado State University. Uh, your special your specialties are intimate relationships and power, especially in the context of the family. Is that fair to say? Before we get to the main thing that I want to talk with you about today, I wonder if we could take a a quick um, a quick detour, a quick sideline to a piece of audio that was broadcast on NPR, the NPR show. Wait, wait, don't tell me. You familiar with it? The NPR yes. Chris, Chris show. All right. This is from 2014, a one minute clip, and it's it's relevant to the issue of families and uh, intimate relationships and power. Here we go. Right now, panel, time for you to answer some questions about the week's news. Kiri, more interesting news from science. Researchers at Iowa State University studied 72 married couples, found out that a key to a happy marriage is how often the wife what? <laughs> How often she agrees with him? Exactly wrong. How often he agrees with her? Exactly. How often she gets her way. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> this is what happened. They took these 72 couples, and they asked them to rate their levels of happiness, and then they videotaped them as they discussed some topic of importance and, and difficulty between the couple. The result, the happiest couples, according to both the man and the woman, keep in mind, were the ones in which the husband quickly, intently, and enthusiastically <laughs> gave in to the wife's demands. Yes! And once again, I say, this they had a study. I know, I know this they had a study? Yes. <laughs> Are you familiar with that study? <laughs> I've heard of the study. I don't remember all the details. That kind of refreshed my memory. <laughs> but, yes. <laughs> what, what, what do you think... Do you think that's anomalous? Or is it unlikely that that study could be replicated? Or do you do you think that it tells us something about power in families? Well, I mean, you know, obviously they're going to present sort of the main effects that they found in the study. I'm sure that the other results were a bit more nuanced than that. <laughs> um, I think because I know some of the people who do work in couples and a lot depends on what they're talking about. Um, you know, the topic of discussion um, and who has um, influence over that domain. For example, sometimes if it's about money or something like that, and whoever makes the most money tends to have more power. So I think it really depends on what people are trying to decide on, right? Um, if it's stuff related to parenting, usually mom gets her way. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you know, yes. there, you know. Yes. So it's it's a lot on what people perceive the other person's expertise and power to be. Very so. good. Very good. Thank you. And and no doubt NPR uh wait wait don't tell me it's a comedy news quiz. No no doubt they were going for the for the punchline. Um Right, right. Okay. So let's now get to the main topic that I ask you to be on this show for. Um, along with intimate relationships and power, uh, one of your specialties is family violence. You also uh, list parental alienation as one of your 
your topics of interest. So I read something online back in December um, in on a website called The Conversation. And what, um, what I read was an article by a woman named Joan Meyer, who said that, this is a quote, courts reject 81% of mothers' allegations of child sexual abuse, 79% of their allegations of child physical abuse, and 57% of their allegations of partner abuse. And she said that she came up with these conclusions uh, based on a federally funded study uh, that was published in what appears to be a pretty authoritative publication, the George Washington University Law School Public Law Research. It was a public law research paper from George Washington University Law School. So this looks pretty scary that our judges are rejecting what the mothers are saying. What do you know about this? And of course, I know what you know about this, but it's good for you to explain it. You can do it better than I can. Well, first, I'd like to comment on the George Washington uh, place that was published. It's actually not peer reviewed. It's a repository where faculty can just upload articles. And I've learned recently that from the editors that no one even reviews it. So first of all, that's highly suspect. <laughs> that means no one has given a second pair of eyes to it. No, no scholars, no scientists have looked at it to give her feedback and question her methods, her statistics, etc. So there's a first problem. And that should be a really big problem for most people. Second, I published a paper uh, with Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos spring of last year. That was based on, uh, we tried to essentially replicate her study that she reports. Um, and the way that you usually do replications is if the, you usually as a scientist, you would report everything you did. Like, so you would list all your methods, you would show your statistics, you would describe very clearly how you, how you got your data, who did the data or analyzed it, who, who coded it. She didn't do any of that in her 2019 paper. And so we emailed her directly and asked her for the information because that's the next step you would do if you're a scientist. You would ask for the information. Uh, she declined to give it to us. She told us that it would be available in about, you know, whenever the National Institute of Justice decided to upload her information, which wasn't for another year. So we were left to recreate or essentially try to recreate her study on her own <laughs> because she wouldn't assist us. Uh, and because we were very suspicious about what she had done. Because if it's, I mean, if it's true, that's horrible, right? You know, if those statistics are true, that's really bad. But they should be verified, always verified, especially if the original study was not peer reviewed. And so, and she's, and she's been trying to change policy and laws based on that particular study that she's talking about in that article. So what we did is we took her hypotheses that, she, or not, she didn't even have hypotheses, which is the sad thing. <laughs> As a scientist, you should always have a hypothesis. Uh, so she, we took her findings in her paper and we worked backwards and we tried to figure out how best to test her hypotheses. Or we created our own hypotheses to test her findings. And in the paper that we published, it was published in uh, Psychology, Public Policy, and Law, which is a journal of the American Psychological Association, really good journal, peer-reviewed by scientists. And we, we detailed over 30 problems that we found with her study, just based on what she reported. We don't even know. Most of it has to do with transparency because they don't report their statistics. They don't report anything to help evaluate whether what they did was a valid method or not. Um, and when she finally did post her code book, or when the National Institute of Justice finally posted it, I was even more concerned. Because what she reported 
and she's admitted under oath in in court. I've, I've I've seen transcripts where she's admitted. They never investigated whether the allegations made to court were true or not. She only said that if somebody raised it as an issue, then if regardless of what happened, they just coded it as the court didn't believe them. If they if they investig so in other words, if they investigated it, found out that there were no no evidence, there was nothing to substantiate the allegation. She reported that those cases were rejected by the court as if it's like nobody's believing the parent, which is completely wrong. And so when we did our study, we looked at appellate cases in the United States where alienation was either alleged by somebody to have happened or it was found to have happened by the court or a psychologist. And we didn't find any support for any of the findings that Meyer and her team published. We didn't find that courts were getting it all wrong all the time. I mean, courts are not perfect, right? <laughs> Systems are not perfect. <laughs> They're going to get things wrong. But it was clear, based on our review of the cases, and we had almost a 1,000, that courts were taking allegations of abuse very seriously. And they were looking into them very closely. And multiple people were looking at those cases very closely. Police, CPS, et cetera. And we did not find gender differences in who lost custody in those cases, unlike what Meyer claimed. That's my shortest answer. <laughs> I could go into it a lot more details, but yes, we, yes, we published you could. it in a, in a scientific journal, et cetera. Now, she, about four months after the 2019 paper she published in the archive or this repository at George Washington University, she published what she alleges to be another peer-reviewed study that validates the, her findings. And it wasn't a, it, at first it was a special issue of a journal, meaning that she was invited to write it. She didn't write it with her other authors, which is odd. Usually if you do a study with other people, you, they also get credit on other papers. If it's a special issue, it's usually edited by people who are already biased in favor of what you're going to write about. And it was a special issue devoted entirely to trying to say alienation isn't real. <laughs> so it tells you that there was an agenda. And then last, in that paper, she doesn't report any statistics again. She only reported uh, percentages, and you don't know where these percentages came from. And you don't know if she made it up. You have nothing to verify it. She finally reported a search term that she used to analyze her or to, to get her cases, but that's the only thing new that was published in that article. So it's not, and it was a, not in a very good journal either. It was not a scientific journal. It was a journal published for, I think, just professionals in the field. So there's a lot of problems with her publications. So I wouldn't put a lot of weight on them. So... One of the big differences here between you and Joan Meyer is that you are a scientist. She yes. is, a, is a lawyer. And the ethics of those two professions are very, very different. The, your ethics are you try to find the truth. You know, you, you, uh, through many iterations, you, you, you work your way to the truth and you put, it, put your findings out there and you let your colleagues say what you did right, what you did wrong, what you could do better. Let's try it again. She's a lawyer. Her ethics are you kick butt for your client. Isn't that basically, yeah. you know, and, and she is kicking butt for whom? Yeah. She's an advocate, right? And she's, she admits she's an advocate. <laughs> she, you know, she's an advocate for women and children. And what's interesting is when we had a member of our research team reach out to her to get information about her cases that she used in the study, we, um, we, we, we have the emails that, that she responded with. Um, all the information about our study, as well as the correspondence with her, is, is on Open Science Framework. So anybody can see it. So she's tried to tell people we never contacted her when the emails are publicly available to see that we did try to contact her. And her response was a question about how many men and women this person served in her practice. Now, I don't know why that would matter if you're a scientist asking for cases 
about a study that you're trying to push as being the kind of groundbreaking study that's going to change policy, you know, that's your response to that question. How many men and women do you have in your practice? That's very suspicious. Um, and then she sort of stonewalled us after that when we tried to ask for the information. So anyway, um, it's, it's disturbing. It's very disturbing. Because as a scientist, I'm always, yes, I mean, I didn't know what we were going to find. You know, we, 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 pre, what, we did what we call, we pre-registered our hypotheses, meaning that we, we put our hypotheses into an archive and they're locked away. And then we test our hypotheses and then we, then we release everything. So you can see that we didn't just make up our hypotheses to match what we found. You know, we went into it saying, here's what we're going to test. Does our research actually support what we said we were going to do beforehand? Because a lot of times people who aren't scientists, they, they don't know to do that. And then they end up manipulating their results or their interpretation of their results to match um, their belief system. And that's not objective. And that's not scientific. And so, um, so lately, especially in the social sciences, there's a huge push for objective or to, for transparency, because we're trying to make sure that people aren't manipulating their data or or lying about things that they've done, or, you know, or that they did in their their study, or hiding things to to hide mistakes that they made. Um, so, but unfortunately, you know, that's not something that she did in her study. Mm -hmm. Do you have any? Any knowledge of how fond judges are of having to do their family law rotations? <laughs> yeah, I've heard some people really dislike it. Um, and I can see why. I mean, it's really contentious and stressful. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it, what's interesting is I've seen advocates such as Joan Meyer tell the media, and I've heard this from media professionals, that she tries to tell them that all the all the case, the only cases that may actually make it to court are the high conflict ones, um, and that most people settle out of court. And I don't have any statistics on that, and I don't think that that's entirely true, because even if you settle out of court, it still has to go in front of a judge to approve it. <laughs> so, so judges are still having to see the whole gamut of cases, not just the really bad ones, you know. Um, so I think that, you know, there's some misinformation about how often people have to go to court. Um, unfortunately, the court has to resolve issues such as divorce and, you know, custody and, and child support. Um, you may not, they, people may be able to come to agreements outside of court, but things still have to get, get approved. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard area and it's, um, it requires, I think, unfortunately, some, um, a lot more understanding of human psychology and child development and things that a lot of the judges don't have. And so they rely on experts, which is understandable. You should rely on experts who can help inform the court. But unfortunately, I think what I, what I see and I'm very kind of disappointed in is a lot of times they'll bring in mental health experts and not scientists to, you know, and whenever I testify in court, a lot of courts are happy to have somebody who's a scientist who can just explain the science and what we know to help them understand the, the basics of the case. But a lot of other courts, they just want a mental health provider to tell them what the problem is and what to do about it, right? And, and so that can be a real problem if you have providers who aren't up to date on the scientific research and don't know best practices right now. Or they might only give opinions based on an association's opinion of what are best practices, which is not a scientifically informed opinion. That's a even more disturbing reality lately that I've been seeing. So we've mentioned parental alienation here. Uh, probably a lot of people who will see this podcast know what parental alienation is, but some may not. Could you give us a quick thumbnail of that? Yes, yeah, so parental alienation refers to when a family dynamic when a child uh, starts or begins to reject or fully kind of, you know, totally reject a parent for reasons that are not legitimate. 
And at the same time, they align with a preferred parent who has been engaging in behaviors to make that happen. Um, now, my research indicates that this is a result of a child being weaponized against the other parent. You know, so if you do research in domestic violence, we know all about weaponization of children. That's like a popular strategy, right, <laughs> that, that abusive people will use. They'll turn their child against a parent. They'll, they'll make the child um, spy on them. They'll have the child, um, th they'll, they'll use the child as sort of a, a way to manipulate the other parent to do what they want. Like, so they won't leave the relationship because they're afraid they'll never see their child again. And we find that for both male and female victims of domestic violence. But where a lot of domestic violence research falls short is they'll look, people will look at the outcomes for children of witnessing violence or being in a family where there is domestic violence. But where they're not looking at is how being used as a weapon changes the child's attitudes and feelings towards the parent that they're weaponized against. And so that's what we call parental alienation, is how it affects the child to be a weapon. And it's caused by the parent who's made them a weapon. So we're talking about the same, we're talking about domestic violence. We're really talking about coercive control. And we're talking about the coercive control of one parent versus another using the child. And so all we're talking about is what it means for that child to be turned against that parent. And luckily, not all kids are affected. I mean, they're affected. It's stressful. But not all kids become alienated, even when a parent's engaging in, like, the worst behavior, which is amazing. I don't know how some kids can do it. Um, but there's a lot of kids who do, and that's... That's what I study. So I study, you know, what is that dynamic when, when it happens? Um, you know, we know that there's a lot of other reasons why a child might resist contact with the parent or reject them. Um, so, for example, in estrangement, you could have a child reject a parent because they, for a legitimate reason, like they were really abusive towards them. But even those children don't really reject their parent that much. You know, they often want to still see them get better. They often still want to spend time with them when they know it's safe. They want them to get help. They feel ambivalent about them. You know, they, they're they afraid of them, but they still see the good in them. Even the most abused kids have those feelings. Um, you could also have a loyalty conflict situation where you have a child just kind of stuck in the middle of two parents who don't get along, right? But that's not the same as a coercively controlling family dynamic, where you have one person who's the primary perpetrator, they're, they have all the power in the family, they're really trying to control the other parent and use the kid to do that. That's what we're talking about. And so that's where the alienation, that's what I study, is what it means for that kid to be stuck in that situation. And sadly, these kids will align with a parent. And in order, you know, in order to weaponize a child, that parent has to make that child believe that the other parent never loved them, that they abandoned them, and that they're unsafe. And so when the child then starts to internalize that, it becomes easier for them. Well, they reject them because they feel really hurt by them, right? They feel like that parent never loved me. It's like a jilted lover, right? You know, how could you not love me, right? You know, and it, that's a primary attachment that a child has. And so that's why you see such strong hatred and resistance to that parent in the really severe cases. That's where you really see that. The kid is so hurt and angry that this parent that they loved doesn't love them anymore, even though they do, but they've come to believe that they don't. They've been manipulated and brainwashed and created a new narrative and a new story of, or a history of the family that the child has adopted as true even though it's not true. It's usually the alienating parent or the coercively controlling parent's narrative of what happened. So. You've mentioned that Joan Meyer has been trying to influence legislation around the country. She's tried to do it here in Maryland. Um, what, what result is she trying to achieve, and what is its relationship to parental alienation? Well, she's repeatedly tried to end, 
her her center as well as her have repeatedly tried to get legislation that says that parental alienation should not be allowable as um, or allowed to be used in court as a as a defense essentially or as as an argument about why um, a parent should have custody or why custody should be reversed. Uh, she claims it's unscientific, even though. <laughs> it's very so I publish in the top psychology journals in the field. I don't know how that's not scientific, especially when you compare to where she publishes. Uh, so but she she makes those kinds of statements. Uh, she she claims that it was something that was just invented to for abusive fathers to get out of abuse claims, even though research does not support that argument at all. Um and you know, so that that's kind of like what what's what they're trying to put through in a lot of the legislation. I've seen it, I've seen it um, come through here in Colorado. I've seen it come through. Yeah. And Maryland was the first place. Um, there's lots of other States where she has organized or their centers working with organizations that are trying to get this passed. Um, or they're trying to also change training. So that way they can control who does the training for judges and attorneys. And then, they can control the content of that training so that the judges and lawyers don't get the right scientific information. And that's scary. And because they made the argument that it's not admissible according to Daubert standards, which is the standard for whether you can admit expert testimony. And yet, just in 2020, Dr. Lorandos, who's both a forensic psychologist as well as a, uh, he has a Juris Doctorate, he published a paper where he found that there were over 1,100 cases in the United States where parental alienation was admitted by experts into court. <laughs> it was considered to be probative or applicable to the case. It was considered important uh, in terms of deciding the case. So to say it hasn't met those standards or that it's not admissible is wrong. So as an advocate, Joan Meyer is trying to achieve absolute impunity for any parent who wishes to alienate a child against the other parent. Particularly mother. And I think if there's a belief that mothers can't be victims of, um, can only be, only mothers can be victims of coercively controlling abuse. And so when they alienate their child, against a parent, they're just doing it to protect them from an abusive parent. That's their belief system. And while that might be true for some women, right, <laughs> it doesn't capture every, the whole population of people who are being alienated from their children. Um, you know, because we do find even in national statistics that men and women are just as likely to be victims of all sorts of types of abuse, right? Psychological abuse, as well as physical abuse. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times the advocates will base their estimates on small sample studies, you know, or studies that were taken in a domestic violence shelter where, you know, most domestic violence shelters are only for women. So, of course, you're only going to have women victims. <laughs> and so it's very biased in terms of who they're basing their statistics on. And so it sends a perception that women are victims. And when they turn a child against a parent, it's just for that child's protection. And, you know, my response to that, that is, you know, parental, making a child believe the other parent never loved them, abandoned them, and is dangerous when they're not, is abusive. You can protect a child from an abusive person without making the child feel that way. You don't have to alienate a child from a parent, even if they are abusive. Because now that child's being abused in both sides <laughs> in, in that kind of a situation. It's interesting, so. how, it's interesting how often we hear that men are the only ones interested in power and control. And here we're seeing evidence up and down the line that mothers are looking to exert power and control. They're even trying to exert power and control over judges and what judges can think and what they can, how they can make their judgments. 
uh, mm-hmm. they, they're, they're, they're interested in power and control over police and how they deal with uh, domestic violence calls. I, I have a degree in social work. I know they, they want to impose their, their power and control over how social workers uh, pursue these issues. It's, it's, really, it's really quite, uh, it's quite amazing how, how good slash bad um, this kind of advocacy can be. It's effective. It's very, it's very uh, slick. But it's really ugly, ugly and cynical. And all the while, they're pretending to be virtuous. And it's only those bad men who want power and control. It's really quite, right. it's, it's, quite it's quite astounding. It's quite astounding. Mm-hmm. Do, do you know the name? I, I wrote about that um, in my book. Um, when I first started getting into this research, I wrote a book called Parental Alienation and How Societies and Institutions Promote the Alienation of Children. And my co-author and I talked a lot about in one of our leader chapters about why we think kind of at the societal level we're seeing that kind of behavior among women. I mean, so if you look at in the U.S., you know, if you look at a lot of countries, for a lot of women, the only basis of power they really have until we have greater equality in in terms of income and other things is with our children, right? (laughs) You know, so... So if women, if the basis of their power is being in the family and they feel threatened by that, then what are they going to have left when that's gone? You know, I, I don't think that people are necessarily thinking logically about that, but I think that that is kind of underlying some of the bigger resistance in our society and, and other societies, too, about, oh, no, if women lose this, then the, they don't have as much leverage and power. But that's a bigger sociological explanation <laughs> for why I think we might be seeing some of that. But but that's why uh, Dr. Edward Crook, you know, up in Canada, he's written about how if we're going to address parental alienation, we need to address larger societal inequity. Because, you know, if people don't have equal pay or equal opportunities for, for income and that kind of thing, there's always going to be inequity. And that serves as a motivator for having children, you know what I mean? So so mm-hmm. we have to kind of think about this also from larger social e- inequity because it explains why we see people just so adamantly against the kinds of changes that protect children. Yes, yes. So I, I would um, tend to agree with that larger sociological explanation you offered. Um, Richard Gardner, the scientist who first started trying to describe um, parental alienation and uh, tried to describe a a syndrome uh, for which uh, he has been pummeled and been called a a junk scientist by the advocates on the other side. Um, he, He wrote that he had been involved in family dynamics and family discord, family breakdown since the 60s. He said it wasn't until the 80s that he started seeing this parental alienation phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Now, my guess about that, my hypothesis about that is that it was in the 80s that men started saying, "Okay, you want equality in the workplace We want equality in the family place. And it was in the 80s that I was the executive director of of an organization of divorced fathers. I'm not a divorced father myself, but I saw these guys up close and personal, and they were heartbroken at trying to be the new man. You know, they invest in their kids. And then the bad. (laughs) And then the same bad old stuff happened to them. You know, yeah. it wasn't so long ago that fathers were told the best thing you can do for your kid after a divorce is go away. Right? Yeah, yes. So we also I, wrote about I, in our, yeah, we also wrote about that in our book, too, is that we, I, I, I noticed where I kind of thought about the generational changes and even thinking about that old Cat Stevens song that was popular in the 70s that, you know, young men growing up then, they heard about, you know, how they never saw their fathers and lamented about that, right? And, you know, Cats in the Cradle, that song, you know, about how, hey, I want to be different. I want to be more involved with as a parent. And, of course, that's threatening then, right, to 
to what we're talking about if, is if that's where women's basis of power is, then that is potentially threatening. Just like, yes. you know, and it, just like, um, it just like it's threatening for men historically to have women in the workplace. <laughs> it goes both ways, you know, because yes. uh, some people have written about it as spheres, you know, like historically men and women have lived in very different spheres. And we see that they still do in many parts of the world. And so as long as those spheres don't overlap too much, you don't see a lot of conflict. But when they start to overlap, which they should, because, I mean, we're, people are being deprived of the benefits of both, you know, of men and women in both spheres, right? Um, and, but when when we do that, it's creating, I think, a lot of um, conflict. There's a lot of growing pains involved with it, right? You know, there's a lot of things that have to get ironed out to make sure that, you know, that we're, people are being treated fairly in those spheres and that um, the the benefits of fatherhood are appreciated in one sphere and the benefits of what women can offer in the workplace are appreciated in the other sphere, right? You know, so that's gonna that's taking a while, but I guess in the history of humankind, it's probably amazing that we've come as far as we have it's just taking a lot of time and there's a lot of casualties in the meantime one of the things that's interesting to me about that fact that it's taking a lot of time is that the people who are pushing for women to have equality in the traditional male domain are regarded as progressive and wonderful and they're very woke and philanthropies and government agencies just can't can't do enough to help them Right. But for men who are trying to be just as progressive and saying, OK, look, if you allow me to emphasize my job less and my family life more, I'll be able to support you having a better chance of getting what you want in the in the business world. But those guys, those men who are saying, I want equality in the family sphere, well, there are you know, troglodytes, they're chauvinist pigs, they're abusers, uh, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And it's mm -hmm. really, really, uh, you know, don't get me started. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's really, it's, it's really very ugly. That, yeah, that's not to say, though, that alienation hasn't happened before. I mean, we it's been in case law for a long time. We just didn't have a name for it. But yeah, but I think there is a definite change in how common it is. And I'm doing. I'm starting to do a lot of cross cultural research right now with some people from Johns Hopkins University, actually, and as well as my graduate student. She's doing some work in Kenya, where in those countries, or in some of the, some of those countries, they're very gender. There's still very inequ a lot of inequality um, in men and women in, in the countries where we're looking at, like in Colombia, for example. Um, and so we're interested to see, like, if and, and but they always give custody to mothers. So even though the fathers tend to have more power in those cultures, mothers get custody. And so we're, we're exploring, like, what's happening in those families? You know, like, do we see some of the same dynamics? I mean, what are, can culture explain some of it or is it more? We don't know. So we're starting to explore that in other places because I'm, I think some of the questions that you're asking me, too, or that we're talking about, the only way to really kind of come to some answers is to start doing some comparisons. Um, in other parts of the world and to look at, um, you know, how family conflicts are being handled in those families. And, you know, and, and especially in countries such as like Ethiopia or Kenya, where gender-based violence is really, um, it's, it's really high compared to here, right? You know, there, where, where there is a lot more male um, perpetration. Um, but, you know, so then the question is, are women then alienating their children, too? You know, we don't know that. You know, I mean, so we don't have a lot of answers to those questions. So we're, you know, are they trying to protect their children in the best way they know how? And I don't, we don't know. Or is is it, is it really as gender-based violence as, as we know? Or are they just measuring it in biased ways? You know, or should we use different measures? We don't know. We, there's a lot of questions we don't know about. So that's what that's what I'm trying to work on now is trying to, really expand and get into some other countries and see what's going on there. Are you, are you uh, putting in um, grant funding requests for, for this research? And are... so. Yeah. So one of my, one of the projects is already kind of piggybacking on a grant that a colleague of mine already has. Um, and with the hopes of when we look at the data, it can serve as pilot funding or, you know, pilot study research to apply for grant funding. 
Because a lot of times to get a larger grant, you have to demonstrate that there's something there. You know, you have to have some pilot work uh, to demonstrate that there's something that is worth putting money into to looking at. So that's what I'm working on right now. Um, so I'm getting so, there. <laughs> it's, so, it's so a long process. Please, to, pl please tell me that the answer to, to this question I'm going to ask is no. Um, <laughs> we, we've talked about various biases. Um, in favor of virtuous mothers and against uh, monstrous fathers. Um, do you see any such bias in the funding agencies? Not yet. I mean, we'll see. I, I can answer that question probably in, a, in about two or three years, and I'll let you know. <laughs> um, I think what 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 I anticipate is going to happen, it's more from the reviewers. It'll be like a reviewer of any other journal. You know, if the reviewers are scientists, then I don't think there would be as much criticism of, of a proposal. I think if it's based on other people who are practitioners reviewing it, there would potentially be people reviewing it who are biased and have ideological blinders on when they're reviewing it. Um, because they're clinical than, people, not scientists, right. right? And there are some good, there are some good clinicians out there, obviously, who are scientist practitioners and mm -hmm. get it. But there's always the potential, depending on, I think, where you get the funding from. Like National Institute of Justice has historically funded research for domestic violence against women, right? You know, that's long. We, we know that that's a lot of what they, they fund. Um, well, how did do, that how are, did that come how did that come to be? It, it's it is in the federal right. government, and the federal government is run by politicians. Mm -hmm. Is 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 there? You're you're a scientist. You don't have evidence. I'm I'm not a scientist, although I like science. I'm just suspicious as hell that there is, uh, you know, political influence on what and I. National Institutes of Justice will fund and what it won't fund. It funded Joan Meyer here, isn't? Is it? Aren't they the funder of the Joan Meyer study? On their board to review grants. <laughs> so, I mean, I think you know, wow. there's no no question. And and when we tried to raise issues with concerns about her study to Na National Institute of Justice, a large group of organizations came together to write a, a joint statement raising the issues that we identified with it. And she even admitted on page eight that she essentially did what we call p hacking. She says on page eight that she took her results and manipulated them essentially and magnified on the results that were there to get the results she wanted. And she says it in one sentence. And that is completely unethical. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a joint statement, a large organizations, groups of, I'm president of International Council on Shared Parenting. So I was part of kind of representing that organization and a lot of other folks. We had like, I think 20 organizations write to the National Institute of Justice. And they did not do anything. Said they is the problem, just, is the problem I mean, that, there essentially kind of that NIJ is part of uh, the Justice Department and that's lawyers, not scientists, advocates, not scientists, ideologues, not scientists? I, I mean, I don't know what percentage of them are, you know. Um, I do know a lot of people who work in criminal justice, a lot of my colleagues who say that yeah, a lot of the funding, a lot of the projects that they fund are not very good, like scientifically, um, which can maybe reflect who's reviewing it. I, I don't know their inner practices. Mm -hmm. Given given how they responded to and how they funded Joan Meyer's work, I'm very skeptical about it at mm -hmm. this point. And well, I we're have a feeling have... what that tells me. I'm not going to get any funding from them if I'm studying alienation. <laughs> It's not worth it's not worth even trying because I have a feeling they would have somebody like Joan Meyer review it and reject it out of hand. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we have to wrap up. You you need to to get on with the rest of your day. Just very quickly, uh, the 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 phrase the term advocacy research should be uh, an oxymoron, shouldn't it? On the one hand, you got Joan Meyer as an advocate. We got you doing research, and they're they're very different. Is, yeah. is that yeah, kept, it, it was, they got to be? It's like the science denial movement, where you have the people who are not scientists 
trying to make statements about science and then they make ad hominem attacks and label people who do science to try to undermine their credibility. That's a perfect example of that. Um, I've seen this. Uh, Robert Emery has written that, um, as well as some other people at the AFCC or the American Family Conciliation and Courts. They've tried to depict people who study parental alienation as being advocacy researchers, even though we're using the scientific method, you know, <laughs> we're using best practices, we're publishing in straight science journals or forensic science journals. And then when you look at where they're publishing, they're publishing opinion pieces, not based on data, and they're publishing and citing each other in this like round robin style, like what we call, they create like a woozle, they create um, yeah. uh, something uh, I, that's not there. And yet the people who are actually doing research and publishing data and conducting studies and using the best, method, best methods that we have, we're the advocates somehow, just because yeah, we're trying yeah. to study child abuse. Well, it, Joe, Joan really Myers... Hard. Joe's John Meyer's research will be uh, embedded in many woozles because a woozle is uh, a reference to um, a study that people don't uh, take the time to understand and look at. And even though it's it's bogus, it's going to be quoted and quoted and quoted and used in citations and citations and citations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. But I so, think it's all right. to call it out. Like probably if people are citing it, call it out and say, nope, <laughs> nope, not credible, not credible, not credible. Yeah, the, um, the, 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 the you know, the problem, the real, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, how many professional women's advocates are there? I mean, I, let's call it Big Fema. How many professional members of Big Fema are there who are well-paid, well-resourced, well-staffed, and how many... How many advocates are there, <laughs> volunteer or not, uh, for, you know, us uh, devilish, horrible, monstrous men and fathers? It's, it's just, uh, it's, uh, it definitely is David and Goliath. Um, right. I, I think I have to let you go, right? <laughs> yeah, I should probably I need to head out, but. Okay. Yeah, if we could schedule another time. <laughs> I'm just talking about it. There's okay. So. <laughs> yes, there, cer there certainly is. There certainly is. Jennifer Harmon, thank you so much for your time today, but even, mm -hmm. you know, much more than that uh, for the work you and uh, Dr. Is it Leandros? Is that his uh, name? Lorandos, yeah. Lorandos, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, which, which you did to um, take down Joan Myers, even though she's still out there talking. This thing in the, the conversation was back in December of 2021, even though she's been yeah. pretty well... Um, refuted, you know, she, she's sort of like a zombie. She's just the walking dead, you know, and, and she's yeah. still she's still out there scaring people. <laughs> you know, yeah, all right. Right. Our study isn't a direct replication, so it doesn't prove anything, which I guess yeah. if you're not a scientist, you would believe it. Yeah. If you are a scientist, you'd look at it and go, no, <laughs> yeah. that's not what happened. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go back to the Bar Association. All right. All right. All right. Jennifer Harmon, thank you a million. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Goodwill Toward Men. Did we deliver? Did you hear something that made you think, wow, I never thought of it like that? If we did, tell your friends. 